Give us a thumbs up when it's time to go. Well, this is your event starting. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Third Thursday. Uh, Third Thursday is a worldwide monthly broadcast presented by svslearn.com where we tackle a subject pertaining to storytelling, uh, storytelling illustration, including comics, graphic novels, children's books, book covers, and children's magazines. Each month's topic is chosen to help empower illustrators to strengthen their art portfolio or business skills to help them get more work or to get more, more work published. And we should have a teleprompter next time. Right? <laughs> right. So welcome everybody to our third Thursday live from the SVS studio here in Provo, Utah. This is Will Terry. I'm Jake Parker. And our guest today is uh, David Dibble from BYU. Hello. Say hello. And then here we have Skyping in with us, Lee White. Say hi, Lee. Isn't he cute? Hey, everybody. <laughs> and uh, this is our first time live streaming anything this way. So anything could happen. Bear with us. I We've done multiple tests, so everything should go fine. Um, and uh, the topic we're, we're talking about today is um, uh, how to do art school right. So... Let's uh, let's go for that. Oh, so we got an echo going on. Oh, okay. One second. <laughs> <laughs> we we did everything we could to prevent the, the no echo, echo monster. Before. So. Um, we're sorry, but we will get this perfected over time. <laughs> Be good. <laughs> um, so I should have juggling balls. Yeah. Right. So everybody's still, we're live right now, right? Oh yeah, an echo okay. probably really nice. So I, I won't say anything then. Let me check one more thing. One second, let me check one more thing. And then we will we'll get going. I didn't hear an echo on the preview. Okay. So someone's computer is, I'm not logged in on mine. It's, it's pro, I wonder if it's mine. Oh, it could be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and then we'll see what happens. I'm gonna mute it and then no, you guys. Can... There's no, there's no echo on the live stream. Oh, I just checked on YouTube. Okay. I'm yeah. not gonna echo on the on the live stream. So, all right. Oh, maybe maybe Lisa's getting it because she's in the same house with Lee. Maybe, she, yeah. If the two windows are open, in the the preview mode and the live stream mode, that can sometimes do an echo. So. So try that. Okay, sorry everybody. Right after I said this is gonna be I, like I want you guys to know Jake not only didn't get good sleep last night, <laughs> he got in here super early. He has been testing this back and forth all day. <laughs> okay. So. Lisa says no echo now. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's get started. Before we get started on the topic, I just want to introduce who we're talking with. This is David Dibble, Tanner. We got Tanner working behind the computer here, behind the camera. Will you show some of Dave's artwork yeah. for us. Uh, tell us a little bit of your background and what you're doing now and what you have been doing. Sure. That. Um, the quick bit grew up doing art all my life and then went to several different art schools at BYU, did a bachelor's, did grad school in San Francisco at the Academy, and then went to New York and worked for um, concept design at Blue Sky Studios, 20th Century Fox. Didn't intend to be there, was going to be a gallery painter, and then um, the financial crash happened in 2008 and I was desperate and so it pushed me into that and it was the best thing that could have happened to me and then after that uh, about six years there at Blue Sky I came to teach at BYU illustration and concept design and painting and that's where I'm at now I've been there for about going on four years now and cool. they haven't fired me yet <laughs> let me come to work every day I can't, I can't believe it's been four years. I know. It's crazy. It's in my four. So, and I do a lot of gallery work, too. Sell at a, a gallery, the Trailside Gallery in, in Jackson and the Mockingbird Gallery in Oregon. So a lot of agricultural scenes and big oil paintings. I like it. I love, I love the plein air stuff. Like, nothing has wanted me to do that more than seeing your work. Oh, thank you. So someday I'm going to be like, all right, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. I'm ready to learn this. And uh, that'll actually come into our discussion later about how to do art school because there's some of plain air and figure drawing and things that mm -hmm. just the consistency of it, we'll talk about it. Okay, sounds good. So I actually worked with, with Dave at Blue Sky Studios. That's how I first met him. 
and we've just maintained a, a, a friendship and some correspondence since then. And and I figured he would be the perfect guy. I, I just wanted to hear his perspective uh, from tackling this subject about art school because um, I've talked to students of his, and I know that he really has, for lack of a better term, a no BS approach to school and <laughs> and how the you know how the students are learning. And I felt like um, talking to, to both Lee and to both Will and myself that, that we see things that students do that we just scratch our heads at and we see other things that students do that are incredible and really, you know, like really smart way to approach school. And so I just wanted to talk about it. So let's get into it. Um, I have nine different talking points or, or different things that I think students should do and we're going to unpack this and I want to get uh, different perspectives here and maybe we can solve this this problem of how uh, students can effectively do art school. So my first point um, that I think any student should do is figure out exactly what they want to be doing after school and I think a lot of time and I've seen students waste a lot of time trying to figure that out while they're in art school. Granted, I think some of it has to be figured out in art school because you, you don't do know everything, but I think if you go into art school with a, a, a pretty clear vision of what you want to be doing afterwards, that can help your the decisions that you make in art school, the what classes to take, how you approach those specific classes, uh, can give you a, a more effective experience to getting to that point. I've met with people who have graduated from art school that are still like, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. And uh, that always frustrates me. It's like you just went through all of this school and you spent all this money and you still haven't figured out. Mm -hmm. So my advice is before you spend that money, before you spend all that time, do some of your homework first. Talk to some of the people who are in these different professions and see what's good about this particular profession or what's bad about it. See what, you know, see how much it pays, see where you have to live. To, to pursue, you know, if you want to get into animation, you're going to have a better time getting a job in animation if you move to LA. And and you're probably not going to get an animation job living in North Dakota, you know. So some of those things uh, I think are, are important. Um, my question to you, Dave, uh, do you have students who haven't figured out exactly what they want to do? Is that a problem that you've identified? And or do you have students that want to do everything and how do you deal with that or how do you think they should approach this? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that is a problem where your teachers are all very, um, very good at what they do, very passionate about what they do. So you take every class and you think, oh yeah, like I love that now because they love that. Mm -hmm. And then you take the next class and well, they love this, so I should love it too. And so you end up having kind of, you got to try on your teacher styles a little bit, but by that same token, you really do need to have an idea of where you're going. And even if you don't know the exact market, mm -hmm. um, having deciding for yourself that you're going to be an artist, like even before you know the market, like just jumping in with both feet, mm -hmm. you can't halfway mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen the difference between students who really are all in mm -hmm. versus those who are still kind of thinking, well, maybe this is just a hobby side line <clears throat> makes a huge difference just in their mind. Mm -hmm. And part of the how that expresses itself is so too many students are thinking about graduation mm -hmm. as the goal. Mm -hmm. And that's not the goal. Yeah. Like you need to be, your mind needs to be years down the road and that's what you're aiming for and suddenly school's a resource to help you get there mm -hmm. rather than a master to be served. I love that. Graduation is not the goal. Like yeah. that's the perfect way to, that's probably the better way to say this than figure out what you want to do afterwards. But the hard thing is when you're young, that's sometimes all you can see, right? Yeah. So it's the yeah. challenge. And I know for me it was, I went to grad school after my undergrad because I realized after I graduated that no one was going to magically knock at my door and just give me a job. Mm -hmm. And I think too many students think that. They think, yeah. I'm, and they wouldn't consciously say it, mm -hmm. but they're, they're thinking, okay, well, I'm going to graduate and then I'm going to have these skills and I'm going to wake up the next morning after graduation and people are just going to start sending me contracts. Yeah. And that doesn't happen. Nobody knows who you are. And yeah. So you have to actively figure out how to go and do it. Yeah. Lee, did you have anything you wanted to say about that as well? Um, I, of course, I agree with you guys. Um, but some people may be wondering what they should be doing in, if they don't know what they want to do yet. And I would just advocate for 
uh, learning, taking some classes in community college or going to the uh, night classes. Like I went to Art Center and there was always night classes that you could take that are much cheaper and it's a way to figure out what you want to do before entering an expensive art school day program. Hmm. That's, that's really good advice too. Were we going to talk about the difference between physical school diploma and online? Is that going to enter in at all? Or I'm that... sure. Well, at some, that's okay. not one of my talking points. Okay. But but if yeah, if, if you see a good place to insert that, go ahead and okay. insert that. All right. So that's number one is graduation's not the goal. The job is the goal. Figure out what that thing is that you want to do and try not to uh, waste precious time and resources um, at art school trying to figure that out. The, the more you can figure that stuff out beforehand, or like Lee said, taking night classes or community college classes, uh, probably the better off you're going to be. And to Lee's point, there's not one right way. Like, not everybody needs to go to Art Center to mm -hmm. be good. There, especially in today's age with workshops and with online schools, there's so many options mm -hmm. for people um, that they've never had in the past to learn. Right. And maybe workshops and apprenticeships are your thing. And if you want to be a gallery painter, Maybe go take a few workshops from some of these artists that you love mm -hmm. and to know if you even need to be taking a four or year school or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I say um, to, I've been saying and I've been thinking about is take that money that you would have spent on that first semester and go pay somebody to that you, you can be their apprentice, right? <laughs> Just say, I will pay you this money so I can work with you and see what you learn in that semester amount of time with that amount of money or spend it on art schools, online art schools, uh, uh, tutorials, things like that and see w how much that money can get you going in that direction. And if you're not any farther than you feel like, feel like you were, maybe then you can try the art school or, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Second point, and this is um, this is a problem. I've dealt with this in the past, um, and I see students struggle with this as well, and that's learn how to manage your time. So that's number two. Um, one of my approach to this is to spend a couple weeks recording everything that you do. And you look at, you know, I, I spent 30 minutes eating here. I spent 30 minutes unwinding, playing video games here. I spent two hours working on this assignment. I spent three hours on this assignment, and once you've recorded all that for a few weeks, then you can move forward and know, okay, I have to eat, I have to unwind, I have to work on stuff, I have to have a social life, and you can start to fill in your time and really stay organized on top of that. Otherwise, time gets wasted and, and you don't realize it. This assignment takes 20 hours, and I only have 10 hours. You can plan ahead and learn that. So my question to you is, is do you see time management as a problem with art students that you've dealt with? And what are some things that, that they can do to, to work with that? Yeah, um, do you want to talk first? Do you want me to? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, there's, a, there's always a correlation between time spent on a project and the quality of that project when you see a student bring in a project. And uh, I often will ask students off to the side, What's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes, sometimes students have jobs, family, uh, you know, all kinds of things where they just don't have time to devote the, the time that they they should have, and others are wasting their time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's hard to get someone to that point of, I don't know, I, I don't think I've been very successful at at getting someone to stop wasting their time and start. I think that comes from within. I don't mm -hmm. know. What do you think? Well, I'm, it's always very telling to me that students will complain about not having enough time for an assignment in all sorts of reasons, but then when this conversation goes casual, everyone's seen every new movie that's released uh -huh. and is current on every Netflix thing going on and has ideas about social content uh -huh. um, that I've never heard of. Uh -huh. And I think, well, how did you not have time to do this work? And so some of it is just figuring out what your priorities are yeah. and pre-planning in those chunks. And if yeah. you know that you have a tendency to want to do some of those things, then schedule in a few hours here or there to your point uh -huh. where you say, okay, it's important to me to keep current on this show. Then take an hour or two and, and schedule that, mm -hmm. but not feel like you have to binge watch everything. I know when I was in grad school, one of my professors said the turning point for her was when she made the decision to fully be an artist. That meant that Friday nights 
she was in the studio when her mm-hmm. friends were out watching movies. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so, like, my wife and I, we say Saturday night's our date night, and mm-hmm. Friday, Thursday are my studio nights, and we mm-hmm. pre-plan that. Mm-hmm. And we were pretty religious about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so pre-planning is a big part of it. Yeah, that's huge. I think you're right. Lee, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I do. I do. Um, back to your point, Jake, about, like, really tracking your time and seeing what's happening with it is a really important starting step. Because most people think they're busy, like they say, you say, what'd you do all day? They say, oh, I worked in the studio for eight hours or 10 hours. But then if it, you know, they really track what they did. There's a lot of downtime and like you're saying, socializing and social media and all this stuff. It's not really focused time. So really getting a, a handle on where the time's going first. And you'd be surprised at how balanced of a life you can have if you work hard and dedicated hours. And then, you know, when you do want to go see a movie, you don't have to feel guilty because the work's already done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just really understanding it and having a formal system uh, is key. One thing that I've done um, that I've found works personally for me for time management is I'm, I'm hooked into social media just like a lot of my students are. Mm-hmm. And that little thing going off and, you know, who's sending me a message and who's just texting me, I'll put my phone in the other room sometimes. Yeah. Because... It, the thing is, when you're when you're designing, sometimes the thought processes that go into making art don't come in ten, five, ten minute segments. They come in half hour segments. You right. Know? You know, and so to get an interruption could have altered the course of your project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. Um, I want to move on to the next one? Actually, I'll, I'll say one more thing. I call it a time audit. That you give yourself a time audit, and even if you don't schedule yourself out if you just are recording like okay I spent the last half hour surfing social media like I looked at the time before and I looked at the time when I stopped and I really have nothing to show for this last half hour the next half hour you're probably going to be more productive knowing what you just did that last mm-hmm. half hour so hey, can I can I add one more thing Jake? yeah there's a program called self control and there's mm-hmm. a couple of other ones out there that will turn off all the sites that take up your time you're the one that picks out what what sites get blocked mm-hmm. but when I'm in the studio and it's a work day I block out everything for you know seven hours eight hours nine hours and you can't access anything that you haven't pre-planned which is which is crucial That's cool if you're if you're addicted to it like will was saying I think a lot of people are they just check 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 it all day long yeah no it's good so use utilize tools to help you whether it's putting your phone in the other room or leaving it in your car or utilizing tools to help you focus, I think that's good. All right, number three uh, is, and this is something, a problem that I've seen with students is become familiar or proficient at least, at least familiar, but proficient is ideal at the fundamentals. I've, I've, we were talking about this earlier and it's like you go listen to, you go see these students who are doing violin in the music program and they know their scales and they know everything and they're there to like refine and just fine-tune everything and then I meet the art students and they're like wait how do you do perspective again and I'm just like this is something that should have been you should have like picked up on at least cracked open a book on perspective prior to this so things like perspective things like light and shadow um, you know basic color theory uh, you know that that orange and, and, and yellow, will, or no, what am I going to say, blue and red make purple, mm-hmm. um, things, things like that, what other, uh, uh, composition as well, um, um, understanding of how composition it's Just works. like the fundamentals of drawing too, I mean like yeah. how to construct a, a more complex shape from simple shapes. And so, so my question, and I really want to hear what you think about this Dave. Um, is art school the place to learn the fundamentals, or should they be learned beforehand? Um, yes. Okay. And so, <laughs> because the fact is that these are the things that I deal with now. Like, mm-hmm. that you're never going to get away and master mm-hmm. these things. You're going to mm-hmm. be dealing with them your whole career. Mm-hmm. However, having said that, students who haven't had it, who aren't proficient at a certain point, mm-hmm. um, are going to have a really hard time. If you come straight into our program and you don't have a proficiency there with a lot of that, mm-hmm. you're going to be at a disadvantage. And within four core classes, it's not enough time to get kids up to speed. Mm-hmm. So you, like that person who just picked up the violin for the first time and expects to 
be the first chair in the orchestra mm-hmm. in a month. It's just not going to happen. Right. And so coming in with a basic proficiency of that is important. And mm-hmm. the two things from that group that I find are most important at a basic fundamental level are just an observation, an ability to be observant mm-hmm. and to draw what you see is super vital. Because mm-hmm. until you can understand that gap between what you see and what you're doing, that's hard to teach kids. Yeah. And when they think, oh, I did a drawing and it should be fine. And you're like, no, you're trying to help them see what the difference is between what they just did and what they were looking at. Yeah. That's really hard to do. So if you can come in having observed and be observant, uh-huh. it's vital. And the second thing would be being uncom- being okay with being uncomfortable and uh-huh. vulnerable <laughs> and being able to take critique, having mm-hmm. had critique before. If you've never been critiqued before, if you've never had that type of feedback, mm-hmm. art school is very difficult yeah. for you. And yeah. so I think those two things, observance and um, being open to critique and feedback is really important. I love that. Good stuff. How do you know if you're open to critique and feedback? Get it a lot and, <laughs> and see if your first, if your first um, reaction is to be defensive and to talk a lot. Right. Um, you have two kinds of students. You have the defensive students or the yeah, yeah students that are, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. They're agreeing with everything, uh-huh. but they're not really wanting to listen to the critique. Uh-huh. They're both coming from the same place of discomfort, right? right? right. One is just being overly agreeable because they want you to stop, and the other is being defensive because they want you to stop. Right. Yeah. And so <laughs> if I think just being personally aware of how you're reacting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I know for me, before I, I ever stepped foot in an art class, uh, a, a college-level one, a lot of my critiques were from my mom. And everything was awesome, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Isn't there a song called that? Yeah, <laughs> the Lego song. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you guys didn't have anything else to add to that, I'll move on to the next one. I, I have one more thing to add to that. Okay, go for I, it. This, this was a great question that came up on the, um, the SVS forums the other day. That was it was a student who's struggling with basic stuff, the fundamentals, and they they asked, "Do I need to learn to draw to do all this stuff realistically?" in order to move my art forward. And I thought it was a really interesting phrasing of the question and just an interesting question in general. And my reply was, you don't have to, if some of you guys are wondering that, do I need to be a realist painter or drawer? Um, I don't think you have to, but you have to learn how to construct well. And that means build solid worlds and cohesive worlds. But if, I mean, what do you guys think about that? Does, it, does everything need to be rigid to realism or could somebody study say like an more of an animated style and still build that you know use those solid construction techniques and you know and color theory and all the other stuff that goes with it with the with the one exception of maybe perspective where that has to be learned uh in a, in a very uh traditional way I, no i think that's good i like maybe the test is can you draw a tree without looking at a tree or can you draw a human face without looking at a human face like that might be you know, it doesn't have to be a good human face. It doesn't have to be a good tree, but believable and acceptable. I think that might be a good test for yourself. Yeah, you I know? and I obviously am biased because I have a very representational program. Mm-hmm. But if stylization is the definition of that would be a definition, would be the amount or the percentage from reality, right? And the more stylized, the more something's diverging from reality. Mm-hmm. So the more it feels representational... And realistic the less stylized it is yeah so I think the more for you to be able to stylize you do need to learn to observe and you may not have to spend 20 years in an atelier as mm-hmm. a representational artist but you do need to be able to draw exactly what you see whether it's a still life and a figure and then you can start to diverge from that consciously rather than have that be a default I don't know how to do anything else right. and so style my style is that that's the only way I have, know how to draw. Yeah. And I think it's really attractive for students to look at the anomalies, the successes, the Mo Willems who mm-hmm. have built this amazing career selling millions of books on a really stylized style that just sort of happened. And he's even a, an artist that will say, I'm not a traditional illustrator. Yeah. But he's got this thriving career. And I think to become more um, marketable, you, you do need those. I, I, I would yeah. I would agree. Because uh, in most concept studios, every film, you're going to be changing styles. Mm-hmm. You know, you get, work on Peanuts, you have to learn how to draw like Charles Schultz. You right. work on this other, you have to learn how to draw like them. Right. And so if you don't know how to consciously change that, if you just have your one-trick pony, mm-hmm. then that's going to be what you can do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So the next one, number four, is related to this, and it's draw a lot. And I'm, it's upsetting to me to find an art student that hasn't filled a sketchbook, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I remember one time, I'll tell a story, there was a student that was frustrated because she wasn't drawing as well as she felt like another class member was drawing. And this other class member was really good at drawing. And I went over and asked her, I said, you know, you're really good. You're, you're like heads above everybody else here. And I'm just curious, like, how often do you draw? How long have you been drawing? And she said to me, since seventh grade, she has filled like a good sized sketchbook every month. And she was a couple years into, into college. And it was just sheer drawing, 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 drawing. And so I, I feel like you don't have to draw that much, maybe. <laughs> but just being able to hold a pencil and put an idea down on paper and have it look like something somebody else can understand, I feel like that is something that you need to learn to do, you should be doing, and it's something that's going to benefit anything else you do, whether it's, you know, even if you're painting, there's still drawing happening with the brush. Mm -hmm. um, there's still s stuff like that. So I would say my advice is draw a lot. And if you need some sort of yardstick to make sure you're drawing enough, have that goal to fill a sketchbook every few months, something mm -hmm. like that. I think understanding the purpose of drawing as well and the sketching and sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. One of the classic things I see almost every student go through is that they have their sketchbook and you ask to see it and their friend asks to see it and the first thing we all do is apologize for it, right? We hand it over kind of tentatively and we say, well, it's not finished stuff, it's just a sketch. <laughs> like, don't ever apologize for yeah. your sketchbook again and right. know that it is the, it's not a finished piece. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I see students who come in and they, they have the chicken scratch draw mm -hmm. where they haven't learned how to draw from their shoulder to do mm -hmm. work general to specific to work with basic shapes and construct. They are chicken scratching, and then if they make a mistake, they erase that, and then they chicken scratch mm -hmm. the rest of the way around. Almost every student I have to beat that out of them, figuratively, <laughs> um, because it's, it's ingrained. And right. that happens because when they were young, they showed some aptitude in art. People praised them for it, and then they wanted to do more of that thing to mm -hmm. get praise. And you can't make mistakes because you don't get praised for mistakes. Right. And so then we get very careful, mm -hmm. and we get very tentative and cautious right. and precious in that filth that feeds on itself until we get to college and we've done lots of little tiny precious bad sketches and we haven't progressed and so you've got to get rid of that mentality mm -hmm. say i'm here to make mistakes that's what my sketchbook's for that's what's drawing what drawing is for yeah and let's do some mileage and students to, to, to piggyback off of that students need to understand that art was never treated like a serious subject even like music it, we weren't told that's the wrong note you played it flat or you played it too sharp you have to change that. So we weren't given those corrections. So we're starting, most art students are starting off at, in my opinion, an elementary or junior high level, whereas most English majors, music majors are starting off at a college level when they come to college. So we're, we're just behind because yeah. we weren't ever. Because there's no wrong way to do art. We, we was so right? personal. <laughs> it was allowed to be personal yeah. and all those bad mistakes were allowed to be personal. Yeah. yeah. Did you have anything to add to that, Lee? I do. I, I think it's an important addition. At least it, it, it would be for me if I was a student again. Um, I agree with the with what you guys are saying. Draw a lot, but the one thing that I see students that draw a lot sometimes the problem that arises there is they're not drawing towards uh, getting better. And the analogy I like to use in class is like, what if somebody wanted to get better in golf? You just said go swing the club a bunch, but if they keep swinging it incorrectly the same way, they don't get any better. <laughs> and so what I always add to draw a lot is to address your weaknesses and try to imp actually use the drawing time to try to improve. For example, if you see a lot of students' sketchbooks like you guys are talk talking about, how many times in a sketchbook do you see two characters interacting? Almost never, right? It's always just one character on a page mm -hmm. and they draw a bunch of characters but they're not interacting. Mm -hmm. How many environments do you see in people's sketchbook? Typically not that much. And so a lot of times people are drawing a lot, but they're drawing the same thing every time or they're drawing what they're comfortable with. And I always, so I always add, draw a lot, but do it in, you know, at least approach the things that you're weak at and, and have an intent to the drawings yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and the mileage. Um, they really get better a lot quicker that way. That's fantastically, that's truth right there. Yeah. That's awesome. 
And I've seen, like, to your point, the students who make the most improvement are the ones that target those things that say, I want to get better at hands and feet because I don't ever draw those in the figure and I I can smudge those out. So they really fill up pages with hands and feet and then they get better. And so thank you, Lee, for adding that. It's important. That is good. And I had that in my notes as well. Like, if you're not good in environment, practice environments. If you're only good at drawing males, try practicing drawing females. You know, yeah, that's good. All right, number five. Uh, this is something I, f- I feel pretty strongly about because this is how I grew as an artist, and that is to do a personal project at least once a year. And by that I mean um, some sort of finite finished thing that, that when it's done you can point to and say, I made that, I created that. So it could be a, a book, maybe a, a finished book collection of your art that you've done so far, or maybe it's a portfolio website, or maybe it's... Um, uh, maybe your project is to set up a table at a Comic-Con. You can learn a lot just from doing that, and that requires having finished artwork to display and, and, to, and to sell. Um, maybe you make a children's book or a short film or a comic, something like that. I'm just going off my notes here. But um, it has to be something a person can hold, click on, experience, download, or buy. And I think going off after school and into the real world, people are, are going to be looking for someone who can finish a thing, mm-hmm. who, you know, whose portfolio is based on these projects that they've completed as opposed to these ideas for things that never have, have materialized. Mm-hmm. So my, my question to you guys is, is when you look at portfolios and when you look at what students are doing, um, what stands out to you? Is it, is it something like this or is it enough just to finish the assignments given you in, in school or is it beneficial to, to have these personal projects that you're working outside of it or incorporating your assignments into these personal projects? Yeah, well. So when I was going to school, I remember I would learn something in class. My painting would fail. Mm-hmm. But I would, I would get a vision of what it should have been or what I wanted to do. And so in between projects, I'd start another painting. And we had a studio situation with all the other classmates. And they, people would come by and go, what are you working on? Oh, this is just for myself. And they're like, they were surprised <laughs> that I was working. That? Yeah, can you do that? Are you allowed to do that kind of a thing? And um, and I, that always surprised me that more people weren't willing to give themselves and, and assignments. And I remember people coming back after the break. What did you work on? What did you do? Well, I haven't done anything since last semester. Mm. I'm thinking, don't you like making art? You know, <laughs> right? So. And that really comes down to the graduation versus professional focus. Yeah. Those people that are graduation focused, they're just doing enough to get the grade. That's why they're there. And so once the class is done, they're on break and they're on holiday from art. Right. And those who are thinking differently, it's like, well, what are you doing when you don't have an assignment? When no one's forcing you to do it, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? Yeah. yeah. Like, don't just do a project a year because that's what your teacher loves to do. So it's like, well, I guess I better do that too. Like, well, what do you want to do? And that's going to be an indication of where your career is going to go. Yeah. Cool. Lee, did you have anything to add to that? I would treat personal projects like basically like an independent study, and it should be an ongoing project. And the, and the, the one area I diverge a little bit from you is like sometimes they're experimental projects to just kind of get in and mess with something, and then sometimes they are professionally focused where you're going to do a – you know, put put more environments in your portfolio to try to get more work like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think it's huge. And, and and you know, when I was in school, the last two years of my school, the junior and senior year, we didn't have a single assignment. Like if you didn't do, if you didn't come up with something, there was nothing to do. And I thought it was awesome at the time. I was like, wow, these teachers aren't even teaching anything. <laughs> I was really critical of them, but they really did say sink or swim. And you had, and so everybody by the, by the time graduation happened everybody's work was so unique because there wasn't this overriding assignment that was driving everybody. It was, I, I was going to do a series of book illustrations. Somebody else was going to do some silk screens of robots and somebody else, you know, it was, it was just all over the place. And uh, so just getting into that line of thinking, um, you know, what am I interested in and what do I want to learn and just really diving in. It's a huge component to being professionally successful. And those are the people, by the way, once people get professional, those are the people who change over time and grow their work. Mm-hmm. Whereas right. people who are just professionally mm-hmm. focused all the time, 
in my opinion, stagnate at a certain point, and typically that's like a seven to nine year mark of being a pro, they start to stagnate a little bit because the market changes, their look gets old, and so you just have to keep reinventing yourself, and personal projects are the way to do it. Cool. All right, let's move on to number six, and that is compete with professionals, not with your classmates. Um, and I think a lot of times I'll see students that I've, I've worked with worried about what this other student is doing. And, and I, I've, I've done that myself. Oh, I've got to beat this guy. I've got to create a piece that's better, you know, better than them. Uh, when really the bar is set by the professionals, the, the industry that you want to go into, that's who you're going to be competing with on your way out. So the pitfall from that is it can be discouraging because you are a student just learning. Um, so my question is, is, is that a good mindset to have, to be competing with professionals? And how can that be an inspiration to you and not, you know, something that's defeating to you? Yeah. You go for it, Dave. Or maybe he can take Lee, it. do you want to take that one first? Sorry, we, you're on Skype, so we always just relegate you to the end. <laughs> you're the scraps of the table here, Lee. Sorry. <laughs> Lee, can you hear us? He might be muted. Uh, I just had a little bit of a breakup. I can now. Okay. What was the question? Uh, prof- compete with professionals, not with your fellow students. So the, the question is, is how can that be an inspiration and not something that's discouraging? Um, I, I, I mean, when I was a student, I didn't get discouraged. So I, I guess I would be curious about why <laughs> someone would get discouraged. Uh, what, are you saying that it's that because you're looking at pros, you feel so far, like the gap between yeah. you as a student is too big? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I know for me personally, I was a lot of times looking at what the other students were doing instead of worrying about what um, the professionals were doing, the people that I was actually going to be competing with when I went into the workforce. Yeah, I, I, I always, I, I had the opposite um, view in school because I always already hear, heard my teachers always say like only like a couple of you people are going to work professionally. So then when everybody put their work up, I would immediately discount like 90% of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also I was so motivated by the, by the work that people were doing. I would pour over those illustration annuals and I just couldn't stop looking at it. And I, I never had to do that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I never had to like force myself to look at the pros because that's that's it was just so motivating and I would always hold my work up to those guys and and see where I was falling down and falling short and why did theirs look so good and mine didn't and I would emulate and you know we've talked about that in different style lectures um so I just say I just say you can either be discouraged by it or motivated by it and there are days of course if you have a bad drawing day you're like oh I'm not getting anywhere Mm -hmm. but most of the time just look at it at the work and try to figure out why it's so good why are people getting work and then uh, and let that drive you. But yeah, most of the people in art school, you don't need to be looking at them because they're not your competition at all. Cool. I think Lee's an anomaly in some ways. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think because uh, I've gotten a lot of emails from people, messages um, saying, I don't know how I'll ever get there. And they're looking at social media now. We didn't have that problem. We had an annual come out once or twice a year where we could see new stuff. Mm -hmm. But today you can get bombarded with it on Instagram every day. Yeah. And one of the ways I found to counteract that is that like action counteracts anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Like anxiety happens from feeling helpless and from not taking action, feeling like we can't do anything. So you can take action. One of the ways that Sam Nielsen does it at the animation program at BYU, he calls it his wall of fame. And they did it at Avalanche at Disney to where they would put up work that they admire, let's say 10 pieces that you love, Mm -hmm. and with a space in the middle for your piece, and then once a week they would all put their work up and they would compare and contrast. Mm. And so even in my classes sometimes I'll have students take the painting they're working on, say find 10 examples professionally that you love that are that same idea, Mm -hmm. let's put yours in the middle, and then make an action list. What's yeah. five things that you can work on right now wow. that look, that you can compare and contrast. So you mm-hmm. start to bridge that gap and then take immediate action and then put them away, work on those five things that you just identified. When you're done with that, come up a few days later, put it back in, say, okay, now what are the next five things? Yeah. I'm gonna great. do that. That's, that's good, a great that's idea. That's a good idea. So, I like Stolen. that. Stolen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number seven is uh, network. And this is something that, um, that I think you, you have to start doing if you're not already doing in art school. The thing, I don't, 
I don't know if some art students realize this, but the kids that you're in art school with, you're going to be interacting with them for the rest of your career. Mm-hmm. You're 30 years into your career, 25 years 25, into it, yeah. 25. You're like 40, 50 years into your career. Pretty, pretty old there. <laughs> um, Thanks, Jake. Do you still <laughs> bump into people oh, yeah. um, from, from school Yeah. that are working? And, yeah. Okay. So the way I look at this is there's three levels of, of networking. Um, there's there's like a horizontal network and these are all of your peers and you're gonna want to build friendships with these people and like genuine genuine friendships not just using people to be a part of your network right but but (laughs) but actual friendships the next is like a vertical network so you start um, making yourself known to and building a relationship even if it's a very professional relationship with people who are above you who are um, already working professionals, you know, 10 years ahead of you, five Mm -hmm. years ahead of you, 15 years ahead of you, just so that they know who you are and that you're up and coming and that um, if there's ever something that they need, maybe they might call you because you might fit the the thing. And then there's um, the third one, and I I think this is helpful too, and that's building a network of people who are following your work. Um, and that's mostly done through social media, but you could do it through, you know, self-publishing things and, and doing conventions or things like that. But, and, and maybe that's jumping the gun to, to do a convention. But I, I say be on social media, be present, have it not be a focus, but share with people your journey and say, I am a student. My goal in five years is to get a job at Disney. I want to I want to work as an animator at Disney and join me in this process as I learn how to become a Disney animator and you might get a hundred followers you might get a thousand followers but people are going to be invested in this journey and they're going to want to see if you actually get that yeah you know if you're and this applies to people post um, uh, art school professionals as well and say you know my goal has always been to do a children's book and my goal is in two years to do a children's book and follow me on this process to, to, to do a children's book. And there's a huge payoff when that thing actually happens. Maybe yeah. it takes 10 years, maybe it takes you know, less time, but people are gonna be invested in it. And you never know who is gonna come from that followership. There might be a Disney animator who's following your journey and wants to give you a leg up and say, you know, I've yeah. been watching you for the last two years. Uh, would you like to come in and be an intern or something like that? Yeah. You know? So we're, my, we're interested in the story. We're yeah. interested in each other's story. Exactly. So um, what do you guys think is networking? I guess how does networking play into um, uh, art school and, and, and what should students do to, to build their network? Dave? Well, boy, um, I'm a proponent, and some of it's just personal approach to things, but I think at the end of the day, relationships are more important than things. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, like focusing on the relationships and not just on the things is important and those people that I have networked the best with that are the most if you want to say valuable to me artistically are the ones who are the most valuable personally and so I've built those relationships not out of a feeling like I have to have this person to do this thing for me Mm -hmm. but because I care about them as a person and want to have that relationship and I think especially in our social media time people are are hungry for sincere relationships Mm -hmm. so and, but some of that, even vertically, can be hard. I'm not going to you know, contact the head of Pixar and say, hey, I just really want to be your friend. Right. That's not going to work. <laughs> um, but it is going to be about being sincere mm-hmm. and, like you say, act, being careful to not um, just make someone feel like, they're, um, like they can just do things for you, not just using them. Yeah. But in, as a student, like starting with those around you, there's, those are often the people now that I'm having come back as guest artists to BYU mm-hmm. or those people who were my peers. Yeah. And so I think being genuine and then, um, like you say, involving people in your journey. Yeah. Don't be the mysterious kid in art school. <laughs> Don't put the headphones on and be cool and sit in the back and pretend that you're, you don't have to be part of everything else. Right. And I try to tell my students, like, I try to explain that to them. Mm-hmm. Some of them still do. But I'm like, you're, you're not only missing out on what I'm saying because you... Sometimes you can't hear, well, I turn it down low. But you're not involved in what's going on. And I think I learned, in this general conversation about art school, I think I probably learned just as much from my 
my peers as I did from the teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really valued my art school, my art school experience. Yeah. And that, I know this is another conversation going, well, can you just do it online Mm -hmm. with like what we're doing? And for me, I don't think I could have. I just knowing myself, I think I learned too much from my classmates that I may not have learned Mm -hmm. online. And so, Man, that is the networking thing is so important. Yeah. Can I throw in two things, especially as a student, make a difference? Yeah. Number one, if you're going to email somebody or ask something of someone, which is typical, you see, either you get an assignment or you say, "I want to know more about how this person does this thing." Keep it brief. Like, ask one, maybe two questions. Don't send them a list of ten questions. Yeah. Because they're not going to take the time, or if they do, they're not going to. Uh, they're not going to answer again because you already asked so many things of them. Right. So keep it brief. Be respectful of mm-hmm. them and their time. And the second would be be grateful for what they give you mm-hmm. and follow up with a personal note mm-hmm. or send them a little sketch and say, hey, thank you. That was really super valuable. Yeah. Like we want to know that we're appreciated. And when kids just ask 20 questions and then they're off and never contact you again, um, it's very ungrateful and it's going to you're going to burn bridges that way. Right. That's good. Um, okay, Lee, did you have anything with networking? I, I got two little things to add. Um, one is for you guys to remember, it's hard if you're in school now or you're just studying online, it's hard to put this in perspective, but your careers are long and the industry is much smaller. Right now it probably seems like, oh, the illustration industry is huge or concept design or whatever. These industries are actually really small and your network, the people around you, are, are going to come back into play. It may be 10 years. It's not as fast, I guess what I'm trying to say is the payoff isn't as fast for having a good network as you might want it to be. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm 12 years out of school and 15 years into my career, and now there's a bunch of people for, right from the beginning that I was in school with that I'm now actually interacting with. We, we actually have a, a figure painter coming to make a video Britt Snyder, um, next week we're, we're filming a, a figure painting um, and figure drawing demo. He was in my f- drawing one class, literally the first day I walked into art school. <laughs> He's the person I sat next to. Yeah, that's good. That's a good it's point. so long. And it's and so, so my point is be nice and be cool to people and participate. And the second part of that kind of builds up on that is at some point you're going to be asked to do a group project or maybe you'll just self-start a group project, a game or a comic or something. Bring your A game to group projects because I can still, I did three concept design group projects where we had to do pre-production for a film and I still remember the people who dropped the ball mm-hmm. and, I, and I still have the same memory of that, like, oh, you're not going to perform um, all these years later. And, and likewise, the people who did really well, those are the people that I'm recommending. Mm-hmm. So, so think about it, it's a long time and view it from that perspective. Cool. All right, so the next one, uh, number eight, is supplement. Supplement your art schooling. And the reason being is I don't think an art school can give you the exact thing you need to get to where you want to be. It'll do a lot, and the teachers can do their best, but there's certain things that you're going to want to learn that maybe that teacher can't teach you. And so, like we said earlier, there's so many resources for artists now. There's online schools, there's tons and tons of art books, more than there's ever been, I think. <laughs> um, and I've learned a lot from, from art books, even as a professional now. I'll still flip through and be like, oh, I never saw it done that way. I'm gonna apply that to, to what mm-hmm. I'm doing now. Um, and then there's also access to people. There's It's easier to access people, and there's people willing to, to share uh, what they're doing. There's tons of tutorials on YouTube. What do you do? You guys feel the same way that art school can't give you everything, and how should a student go about supplementing art school? Uh, go for it, Will. Right. Well, one thing that I think some art schools do better than others, I know BYU did this really well for me when I was there. Is they bring in a lot of guests. Yeah. And so, you know, you're learning things that the teachers, the the uh, the the uh, full time teachers, are really good at. But then there are those those other things. So um, I think that's a really good aspect, and I think that's another thing that online can do for you as well, because maybe you maybe you are going through art school and you you bump into somebody or you you have a, a fellow student that is going a different way, and 
uh, or, or has their idea on another track. And so you start to explore that and you find, oh, my teachers don't really know a lot about that and they don't have anybody coming. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll try to look for somebody online that, that's, that's doing that. So yeah. that's, a, that's a resource that we have now that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. Dave? For sure. Um, it's been an interesting thing to realize more than ever as I've taught that really I can't teach somebody something that they don't want to learn. Like I wish I could just open up kids' heads and, and pour it in, <laughs> and I can't. Right. And there's times when if somebody really wants to learn it, they'll progress so quickly. Mm -hmm. And then times when I can talk and give assignments as much as I want, and it won't make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so it really comes down to deciding that you're going to progress in, as an artist. And then like we said, school can be a resource to that. Mm -hmm. but. Who you are as a person is the most important thing, right? Like our art is an expression of that. Mm -hmm. And so if you work on who you are as a person, that's going to make your artwork better. Mm -hmm. So even supplementing with all of these other like technical abilities, supplement your yourself in your personal character too. Like take mm -hmm. some time and go volunteer somewhere mm -hmm. and help out and be genuine in your relationships around mm -hmm. you. And that's going to make your art better because you'll you'll have more experience, life experience to be able to show and yeah. and bring a unique voice to your work. Yeah, that's a I good agree. Point. There's a great quote. Uh, I was watching an interview with J.J. Abrams, mm -hmm. and the time he was finishing high school, and the time was coming. Should I go to film school or should I go to a regular college? He couldn't decide, and his dad's advice to him was, "It's more important that you learn what to make films about than how to make the films." And with that in mind, he decided to go to a regular university and study history and study, you know, mm. interpersonal relationships and just learn about life and then learn the craft of filmmaking after he had some experience and some understanding of the world around him. And I, I think that's a really good, a really good point is build yourself out and your art will be better for it. Even if you're not as good as a technical artist, at least your art has soul to yeah. it, right? And even in the summers during college, actually, I went and worked for Boy Scout camps for three months in the summer mm -hmm. in the woods, and I didn't draw at all those whole three months, but I came back a better artist, mm -hmm. and it taught me how to work hard and how to, um, how to have, a, have a better work ethic and things. And so even just being able to understand some of those things better can help. Yeah, that's good. Lee, did you have anything to add to that? No, I agree, I agree with all that, though. Cool. All right, this is the last point um, in, in at least my list of, of things that to help you do art, uh, art school, right? Number nine is find a mentor and... Ten. There's only nine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Number nine is find a mentor and or do internships. Um, and this art is a craft. And... As a craft, it's so much easier to pick up and learn from someone who's actively doing it or in an environment where it's actively being done. Mm -hmm. um, and so anything that you can do to put, your in a, put yourself in a position where you can apprentice someone or you can be helping someone who's you know, 10 steps, 20 steps ahead of you, years ahead of you, providing to them some sort of value with your services to them because you're going to be getting that times 10 in what they're able to teach you, hopefully if it's a good relationship. Um, and likewise, if it's an internship, being the, you know, really going back to bringing your A game to things, bringing your A game on an internship, not letting anybody down when you're asked to do something and just um, pulling from that internship every, like wringing it dry, every drop you can learn from everybody around you. That I think can help you just as much as all the other things we've been we've been talking about here. Uh, my questions to you guys about that is: Did you have a mentorship or an internship in your upbringing? And is there anything um, a student shouldn't do or should do in this situation? Mm -hmm. Lee, what would you say? I'd say find. I mean. Fine. The internship, I don't know about because I didn't do that, but, um, and, and, and they're far and few between, so that may be a scaling problem mm -hmm. for a lot of people listening in terms of how to get an internship, but finding a mentor is absolutely crucial, and, and that just means picking your instructors carefully. I mean, if you go to a certain school, you're going to be stuck with a group of them, um, but you got to find the one that, that understands what you're trying to do 
and then you respect what they're doing. Because if I, you know, if I would, I'm a real stylized kind of painter and simple shapes based painter. If I go to a very realistic teacher, maybe they can give me the advice I need, but I just need to, I need to know what angle they're coming from. Find teachers that aren't stuck in their way of thinking. If a teacher tried to make you paint realistically, well, we're going in the wrong direction. So once you find that point is find a good teacher and then once you find it, stick with them. And like Jake said, you got to learn everything you can from them and really uh, uh, just be your own advocate. And then as that mentorship changes and as you get better, you're going to start to look for the next one. And so you got to be proactive about finding those mentors. Uh, um, and you can find them anywhere, whether it's online or, or in person at your school. But it, but it really is a, a huge part of learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um I did internship and we have a pretty aggressive internship program and I can see always a huge difference with when the students come back from an internship versus when they left, both artistically that it helps them. I think it's an important bridge and mentorships can be part of this too, but it takes the theory from class that feels kind of esoteric sometimes and, and abstract and it grounds it in reality that mm-hmm. I'm going to wake up after graduation and have to do something like how does this person live their life every day? Mm-hmm. How do they work with contracts? How do they get clients? How do they network? And so just seeing that is vital and usually an internship involves going to live somewhere else for a time and just even understanding that you can move somewhere else like the logistics of life mm-hmm. that you're not going to die if you move <laughs> to a different state right you can still exist um, is really vital uh-huh. so I think that's a real just life skill that is important but then because I look back on my internships and I didn't end up doing what either of those people were doing right um, and you know I got their coffee and walked their dog but I was watching them and how they did things and even those relationships and networking yeah. opportunities came into play later cool well yeah, I, after school, during school and towards the end of school, I made a pest of myself to mm-hmm. some, of, some of the teachers that would have me, you know, yeah. and even some of the teachers that came and visited that lived sort of local, and um, I would call them up and say, and just invite myself over. Mm-hmm. Um, I had made a pretty good relationship with them in class, so I didn't feel, it didn't feel too awkward. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you, as a teacher... The students that come back to me on, they'll come to me and ask for help on other people's assignments, on their own personal projects, on whatever it is. And is, you know, it's, it's never a bother because they're so passionate that you feast off of, you know, I mean, I get excited for them because yeah. they're so excited. Yeah. Um, the drain for the teacher is the person who brings the same sketch up. <laughs> without any changes over and over, <laughs> wanting you to think that they've worked. But when people are really passionate and really mm-hmm. working hard, um, I, I think that's a great thing. And so I mentor a lot of students that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because I feel like I'm repaying mm-hmm. what I took from mm-hmm. other teachers going, can I please come over? And I would write down questions uh, about the business side, the contracts and things like that, because I had no idea. I, mean, I was thrust out, out in, into the real world and I was like, oh, this is, this is go time. Yeah. I didn't really pay attention in class on some of the contract stuff too much, so now I need to go and find that stuff out. And so, yeah. Cool. Well, anything you wanted to add, Lee or Dave or Will, to the whole discussion? Anything else? Any other points? No, I think you covered everything pretty I think good. We all spoke our piece. Yeah. <laughs> do we do we have questions? Um, are we going to be able to do that with the? I don't know. The YouTube. Do thing? we have t- uh, Tanner? Have you been able to see if there's any questions? Um, I think that there are a couple. Just a couple questions. Hey, I can add, I can add one thing while he's fielding some questions. Yeah, I'll get some of these. Okay. And that is, were there? Um, if you're a good student, your relationship with your this goes along the lines of with the mentorship and and just being a good student, getting the most out of your classes. The really good students I've noticed that I've have really long-term relationships with them like on, on I mean I'm, I'm working with a student this week that has contract questions I haven't seen that person in person in about seven years mm-hmm. they were in school a long time ago but I would gladly help them any day because they were really smart in class I'm less inclined to help people that didn't do anything in class and most of the time yeah. those people don't contact me anyway because they either didn't end up working or they didn't have enough motivation or whatever mm-hmm. but but this whole group of people who are really really good in school and respectful and really just passionate about learning 
um, my friendships with them has extended way beyond school. And that's how you can get these uh, answers once you start getting into the professional world. You know, if somebody has a book contract you're not familiar with or wants to have, uh, use your work in some weird way, I get these questions all the time or technical questions or whatever. Um, so your mentorship goes a long way and it starts in school with being a good student and then, and then definitely transitions and it can be lifelong. Cool. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's throw a shout out to, to our friend Cam. Oh, yeah. We were talking about him today. Yeah. So he was one of my students, and then he entered for you, right? Or, or well, we worked together on a project. Right. Yeah. You hired him to work yeah. for you. Cam and Kendall is who we're talking Cam about. Cam Kendall. And his work has gone, from when I first saw him, to completely pro right now. Yeah. Because it, and we, the reason we were talking about him today is because I was just scrolling through Instagram, and I saw a piece from him, and I was like, that can't be. <laughs> this isn't the kid I taught in yeah, school. Right, this, right. Is, this is, Yeah. Yeah, and, and he's a, a guy who, uh, he, he's networked, he's, he's looked to you and me uh, just for help on, on things. He's always asking me, like, can you help me out with this idea, I need, I need your advice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then he's always willing to help out when I needed help on a project. He's like, yeah, I can, I can help on that as well. So there's definitely, that's a good, good example of, of how to... How to Network and mentor. Or, to our school, right? Yeah, to our school, right? <laughs> Tanner, were there any questions? Just a couple. Yeah. We want to wrap it up pretty soon. So Misty is wondering: Does a mentor need? Does a mentor have to be a person you know personally and speak with? Because there are none in my area. The only mentors I have are in this video. <laughs> so that's a good point. And actually, I have mentors and that do I've. Do they? Can they hear me say the question, or do you need to repeat it? Uh, I'll repeat it just in case. I don't know if the microphone works that far back. So, so Misty asked, "Does do you have to know personally the mentor? Can you, you know?" She said the only mentor she has are the people on this video, and she's never met them. And and I actually, uh, because of social media now, and because of YouTube channels and 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 Instagram and Twitter and things like that you can know a lot of what's going on in a person's life if they're willing to share it. Mm -hmm. And there's a handful of artists who are above me that I look towards as a mentor, though I've never met or have only met They don't once. know you exist, right? Right, so like James Gurney. Right. He's a mentor of mine, but he has no idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I look at everything that he posts. I've read his books. Um, I, I, I love the way that he interacts with, with you know, uh, his fans and and the way that he teaches and just his, the nature about him and I try to apply that to what I do how he's so open with what he's sharing and and I think that's a way for me to apprentice under him even though I don't live in Massachusetts right. and we've only met twice you know so uh, so I think that's perfectly valid and there's a couple other people who I see them getting work done and they're showing the work that they're getting done and that inspires me to go get some work done as well instead of sitting around twiddling my thumbs. Yeah. If I could add a piece about mentorship, there's a difference between a mentor, a difference between a mentor and abdicating our own personal responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people want a mentor but what they really want is someone to figure out their life for them and tell them what to do okay. in every situation right. and in every painting. <laughs> and no one can do that for you. Right. You have to make the decision that I'm going to progress, which is why you can look at James Gurney and be inspired and grow from his mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. because you're, you're able to download and, and process yeah. that. We look at um, historically how you know, we have such access to information and artists that we've never had in the history of the world, and yet sometimes, sometimes we're less changed by what we see than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. We just gloss over and we flip, 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 flip through Instagram, mm -hmm. but we're not changed at all because of that. We're not different artists. Yeah. So sometimes I found for me, limiting down, saying, okay, I'm gonna look at one artist right now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna dissect what made that work. I'm gonna do some little compositional sketches of their pieces yeah. so I can start to dissect it rather than just flip 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 uh -huh. and you look at um, impressionism for example how those artists we didn't have you know a lot of marketing of what that show was but you had artists come to those early shows in France mm -hmm. and in New York 
and they went throughout the world, and the world was never the same. Right. They didn't have a, even a catalog to take home. <laughs> they just spent a few days really looking at those yeah. paintings, uh -huh. and they went home, and they completely changed the way that they painted yeah. because the way that they looked and were changed by what they saw. So in your mentorship opportunities, you know, ask, <clears throat> ask less than you actually are doing the work for yourself to really process. Right. That's good. Yeah. Any other questions? I'd say we have time for one more good one. So this one's directed at Lee. Question said, for Lee. He said, this is from Nick in Montana. He says, do you have any recommendations for finding mentorships online that could be done online? I have someone I really admire as an artist. How do I approach the idea of them mentoring me via email? Okay, so if, if you could, did, could you hear that, Lee? Just parse like Okay, so, so he basically wants to know how would you... Um, how could you find a mentor online and do like a basically a, an online mentorship with someone? If you already know the person. Yeah, if you, you if, know who they are. They if you want. already know the person, is there a way to do it? Well, he made this sound like he admires them, but he wants he to doesn't know them. Approach them by he, yeah, how to well, approach. So, yeah. How do you contact them? And how would you approach? How would you basically say, I would like to apprentice under you? Remotely, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question because I see a mentor and, and an apprentice in two different roles. And I do get a lot of emails about the people wanting to apprentice me, both locally and, and, and online. I never know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys do but with that. But I mean, I, other than having an assistant, it's just kind of weird to have somebody just in the studio kind of shadowing you. Yeah. Uh, I, so I it's think different. I, I advocate for a, a, a true mentorship is is take classes, find the people that you think are awesome, and that do something similar to you, and then take classes with them if they offer that, so you can get uh, uh, some kind of inroads into a relationship and their level of thinking, and then after that the relationship gets going. The other way to do that is to correspond with them, like Jake was saying, on social media or on forums are fantastic, like our S. At SVS, we were on these forums all the time. I'm interacting with all these students, and there's a bunch of people that I actually feel like I know now, even though I've never met them and they've never been in a class. Uh, and occasionally they'll send me an email. It's not every day, but you know, every three or four months they'll send me an email and with a question, and I, I love helping out in mm -hmm. that capacity. Mm -hmm. So you just got to find the people that, that, that you want to be like and, and, and try to get into their orbit in some mm -hmm. way, whether it's social media, a workshop, portfolio review, and that's how the whole thing gets going. The apprenticeship, I don't see that working out that well. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a two-way, it has to be a two-way street. The, the, men, the mentor has to get something out of the relationship as well. Otherwise, there's, there's no motivation for them to do it unless you want really want to appeal to like the better nature their better nature you know which um you, you don't want to have to rely on <laughs> rely on that especially in perpetuity right yeah if you want to ask for a critique on a piece mm -hmm. or say hey i'm driving through your town could i stop and and get, get you lunch and have a half an hour for you to look at my work mm -hmm. great it's, it's contained contained yeah if you're asking someone to have an ongoing relationship where really they're teaching a class just for you, mm -hmm. then you're probably asking too much. That's then you yeah. need to look at workshops and things that they've already provided. Unless you want to take that money you were planning on spending on art school yeah. and just say, I would like to buy an hour of your time once a week for the next six months and work out a deal with them and just right. say, you know, what would that cost? Mm -hmm. Would you even have time or interest in that? And maybe you might find a mentor that be up for it. Yeah. They'd be like, oh, that would pay for the family vacation this year. You know, don't, don't be the Hurley Heat boy. The, who's the Hurley Heat the, the, Oh, that's a Saturday Night Live reference. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap it up. One more question. Oh, one Just, more question. Fine. Jocelyn wants to know, will we be doing these on YouTube from now on? The third Thursday. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, either Jocelyn asks, should, are we going to be doing these on YouTube from here on out? Um, we've been wanting to mix it up. We've, we've wanted to get... a access to more people so that's why we thought we'd try youtube if you guys like it we'll keep doing it we'll ask um, on the forums if if sgs forums if people liked it we'll see how the chat went um uh but the idea is to either do it here on youtube or on facebook or maybe a simulcast between youtube and facebook if we can figure out the technology behind it yeah. uh, <laughs>
but yeah, the the idea is is to make these third Thursdays a little bit more accessible to to people. So yeah. and also to get Lee to move out here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> Maybe will will this be posted online? Uh, yeah, we'll 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 have details. You can follow us on Twitter. It's SVS Learn at SVS Learn on Twitter, and you can subscribe to our email list uh, on the website or go to our Facebook page. Uh, just search for SVS Learn or Society of Visual Storytelling, um, and we'll update where these things will be posted, whether whether or not um, we'll be posting it online um, or posting them on the website on the SVS website. And uh, I guess uh, I guess that's it. Um, if you're interested, if you like what you see here, we've got our Third Thursday archives. You can go on the website and see how to get access to those. And uh, we hope to see you guys in October for the, the next third Thursday. That's your, your deal. Do you want to yeah. tell a little bit about what that's going to be? Yeah, what, uh, the topic is something along the lines of what makes a good children's book popular and why some fail, why some succeed and why some fail. Okay, so. and we have a special guest. Yeah, um, Gene Nelson. Gene who, Nelson from the Provo Library. We'll introduce library. him, but he's got a great pedigree. So. Yeah, yeah. And thanks... David for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. Yeah. You really it. I you really rounded us out, so that was good. good. Yeah. Iron to my bottle bar. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Good. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, we'll see guys. you later. Tanner, go ahead and stop the stream and uh, we'll call it good. <laughs>